The Politics of Reality, Essays in Feminist Theory by Marilyn Fry. Essay 1, Oppression. It is a fundamental claim of feminism that women are oppressed. The word oppression is a strong word. It repels and attracts. It is dangerous and dangerously fashionable and endangered. It is much misused and sometimes not innocently. The statement that women are oppressed is frequently met with the claim that men are oppressed too. We hear that oppression is oppressive to those who oppress as well as to those who they oppress. Some men cite as evidence for their oppression their much advertised inability to cry. It is tough, we are told, to be masculine. When the stresses and frustrations of being a man are cited as evidence that oppressors are oppressed by their oppressing, the word oppression is being stretched to meaninglessness. It is treated as though its scope includes any and all human experiment experience of limitation or suffering, no matter the cause, degree, or consequence. One such usage has been put over on us. I'm sorry, once such usage has been put over on us, then if ever we deny that any person or group is oppressed, we seem to imply that we think they have never suffered and have no feelings. We are accused of insensitivity, even bigotry. For women, such accusation is particularly intimidating, since sensitivity is one of the few virtues that has been assigned to us. If we are found insensitive, we may fear we have no redeeming traits at all and perhaps are not real women. Thus, we are silenced before we begin. The name of our situation drained and meaning of our guilt mechanism tripped. But this is nonsense. Human beings can be miserable without being oppressed. It is perfectly consistent to deny that a person or a group is oppressed without denying that they have feelings or that they suffer. We need to think clearly about oppression, and there is much that mitigates against this. I do not want to undertake to prove that women are oppressed or that men are not, but I want to make clear what is being said when we say it. We need this word, this concept. We need it to be sharp and sure. One, the root of the word oppression is the element press, the press of a crowd, pressed into military service, to press a pair of pants, printing press, press the button. Presses are used to mold things or flatten them or reduce their bulk, sometimes to reduce them by squeezing out the gases or liquids in them. Something pressed is something caught between or among forces or barriers which are so related to each other that jointly they restrict, restrain, and prevent things, the thing's motion or mobility, mold, immobilize, reduce. The mundane experience of the oppressed provides another clue. One of the most characteristic and ubiquitous features of the world as experienced by oppressed people is the double-blind situation in which options are reduced to very few and all of them are exposed and all of them expose one to penalty, censure, or deprivation. For example, it is often a requirement upon oppressed people that they smile and be cheerful. If we comply, we signal our docility and our acquiescence in our situation. We need not, then, be taken note of. We acquiesce in being made invisible in our occupying no space. We participate in our own erasure. On the other hand, Anything but the sunniest countenance exposes us to being perceived as mean, bitter, angry, or dangerous. This means, at least, that we may be found quote-unquote difficult or unpleasant to work with, which is enough to cost one one's livelihood. At worst, being seen as mean, bitter, angry, or dangerous has been known to result in rape, arrest, beating, and murder. One can only choose to risk one's preferred form of rate of annihilation. Another example, it is common in the United States that women, especially younger women, are in a bind where neither sexual activity nor sexual inactivity is all right. If she is heterosexually active, a woman is open to censure and punishment for being loose, unprincipled, or a whore. The quote-unquote punishment comes in the form of criticism, snide, and embarrassing remarks, 
being treated as an easy lay by men scorned from her more restrained female friends. She may have to lie and hide her behavior from her parents. She must juggle the risks of unwanted pregnancy and dangerous contraceptives. On the other hand, if she refrains from heterosexual activity, she is fairly constantly harassed by men who try and persuade her into it and pressure her to quote-unquote relax and quote-unquote let her hair down. She is threatened with labels like frigid, uptight, man-hater, bitch, and cock tease. The same parents who would have who would be disapproving of her sexual activity may be worried by her inactivity because it suggests that she is not or will not be popular or is not sexually normal. She will be charged with lesbianism. If a woman is raped, then if she has been heterosexually active, she is subject to the presumption that she liked it, since her activity is presumed to show that she likes sex. And if she has not been heterosexually active, she is subject to the presumption that she liked it, since she is supposedly repressed and frustrated. Both heterosexual activity and heterosexual non-activity are likely to be taken as proof that you wanted to be raped and hence, of course, weren't really raped at all. You can't win. You are caught in a bind between sy systemically related pressures. Women are caught like this, too, by networks of forces and barriers that expose one to penalty, loss, or contempt, whether one works outside of the home or not, is on welfare or not, bears children or not, raises children or not, marries or not, stays married or not, is heterosexual, lesbian, both or neither. Economic necessity, confinement to radical and or sexual job ghettos, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, pressures of com competing expectations and judgments about women, wives, mothers, in the society at large, in racial and ethnic subcultures, and in one's own mind, the dependence, full or partial, on husbands, parents or the state, commitment to political ideas, loyalties to racial or ethnic or other quote-unquote minority groups, the demands of of self-respect and responsibility to others. Each of these factors exists in complex tension with every other, penalizing or prohibiting all of the apparently available options. And nipping at one's heels always is the endless pack of little things. If one dresses one way, one is subjected to the assumption that one is advertising one's sexual availability. If one dresses another way, one appears to quote-unquote not care about oneself or to be quote-unquote unfeminine. If one uses strong language, one invites categorizations as a whore or a slut. If one does not, one invites categorizations as a quote-unquote lady. One too delicately constituted to cope with robust speech or the realities to which it presumably refers. The experience of oppressed people is that the living of one's life is confined and shaped by forces and barriers which are not accidental or occasional, and hence avoidable, but are systemically related to each other in such a way as to catch one between and among them and restricts one's penalized motion in any direction. It is the experience of being caged in. All avenues in every direction are blocked or booby-trapped. Cages. Consider a bird cage. If you look very closely at just one wire in the cage, you cannot see the other wires. If your conception of what is before you is determined by this myopic focus, you could look at that one wire up and down the length of it and be unable to see why a bird would not just fly out around the wire at any time if it wanted to go somewhere. Furthermore, even if one day at a time you myopically inspect each wire you still could not see why a bird would have trouble getting past the wires to get anywhere. There is no physical property of any one wire, nothing, that the closest scrutiny could discover that will reveal how the bird could be inhib inhibited or harmed by it except the most ac in the most accidental way. It is only when you step back, stop looking at the wires one by one, microscopically, and take a macroscopic view of the whole cage that you can see why the bird does not go anywhere and then you will see it in the moment. It will require no great subtlety of mental power. It is perfectly obvious that the bird is surrounded by a network of systemically related barriers, no one of which would be the least hindrance to its flight, but which, by their relation to one another, are confining as the solid walls of a dungeon. 
It is now possible to grasp one of the reasons why oppression can be heard to see and can be hard to see and recognize. One can study the elements of an oppressive structure with great care and some good will without seeing the structure as a whole, and hence, without seeing or being able to understand that one is looking at a cage and that there are people there who are caged, whose motion and mobility are restricted, whose lives are shaped and reduced. The arresting of vision at a microscopic level yields such common confusions as that about the male door opening ritual. This ritual, which is remarkably widespread across classes and races, puzzles many people, some of whom do and some of whom do not f find it offensive. Look at the scene of the two people approaching a door. The male steps slightly ahead and opens the door. The male holds the door open while the female glides through. Then the male goes through. The door closes after them. Now how, one innocently asks, can those crazy women's livers say that that is oppressive? The guy removed a barrier to the lady's smooth and unruffled progress. But such repetition of the ritual has a place in a pattern, in fact, in several patterns. One has to shift the level of one's perception in order to see the whole picture. The door opening pretends to be a helpful service, but the helpfulness is false. This can be seen by noting that it will be done whether or not it makes any practical sense. Infirm men and men burdened with packages will open the door for able-bodied women who are free of physical burdens. Men will impose themselves awkwardly and jostle everyone in order to get to the door first. The act is not determined by convenience or grace. Furthermore, these very numerous acts of unneeded or even noisome quote-unquote help occur in counterpoint to a pattern of men not being helpful in any practical way in which women might welcome help. That women experience is a world. Sorry, <clears throat> what women experience is a world in which gallant princes, charming, gallant princes, charming, commonly make a fuss about being helpful and providing small services when help and services are of little to no use. But in which there are rarely ingenious or adroit princes at hand when substantial assistance is really wanted, either in mundane affairs or in situations of threat, assault, or terror. There is no help when the with the laundry, no help typing a report at 4 a.m., no help in mediating disputes among relatives or children. There is nothing but advice when women should stay indoors after dark, be chaperoned by men, or when it comes down to it, quote, lie back and enjoy it, end quote. The gallant gestures have no practical meaning. Their meaning is symbolic. The door opening and similar services provide provided are services which really are needed by people who are, for one reason or another, incapacitated, unwell, burdened with parcels, etc. So the message is that women are incapable. The detachment of the acts from the concrete realities of the women's need and what women need and do not need is a vehicle for the message that women's actual needs and interests are unimportant or irrelevant. Finally, these gestures imitate the behavior of servants towards masters and thus mock women who are in most respects the servants and caretakers of men. The passage of the false helpfulness of male gallantry is female dependence, the inevitability or insignificance of women, and the contempt for women. One cannot see the meaning of these rituals if one's focus is riveted upon the individual event in all its particularity, including the particularity of the individual man's present consciousness conscious intentions and motives, and the individual's women's conscious perception of the event at the moment. It seems sometimes that people take a deliberately myopic view and fill their eyes with things seen microscopically in order not to see macroscopically. At any rate, whether it is deliberate or not, people can and do fail to see the oppression of women because they fail to see macroscopically and hence fail to see the various elements of the situation as systematically related in a larger scheme. As the cageness of the bird is a macroscopic phenomenon, the oppressiveness of the situation in which women's women live women live our various and different lives is a macroscopic phenomenon. Neither can be seen from a microscopic perspective. But when you look macroscopically, you can see it, a network of forces and barriers which are systemically related and which conspire to the immobilization, reduction, and molding of women's lives that we live.
two. The image of the cage helps convey one aspect of the systemic nature of oppression. Another is the selection of occupants of the cage. An analysis of this aspect also helps account for the invisibility of the oppression of women. It is a woman, or a Chicano, or a Black, or Asian, or lesbian, the one who is entrapped. Quote, why can't I go to the park? You let Jimmy go, end quote. Because it's not safe for girls. I want to be a secretary, not a seamstress. I don't want to learn to make dresses. <clears throat> there is no work for N-words in that line. I learn a skill learn a skill where you can earn your living. When you question why you are being blocked, why this barrier is in your path, the answer has not to do with individual talent or merit, handicap or failure. It has to do with your membership in some c category as a quote unquote natural or quote unquote physical category. The quote unquote inhabitant of, of the quote unquote cage is not an individual but a group, all those of a certain category. If an individual is oppressed, it is in virtue of being a member of that group or category of people that is systemically reduced, molded, and immobilized. Thus, to recognize a person as oppressed, one has to see the individual as belonging to a group of a certain sort. There are many things which can encourage or inhibit perception of someone's membership in the sort of group or category in question here. In particular, it seems reasonable to suppose that if one of the devices of restriction and definition of the group is that of physical confinement or segregation, the confinement or separation would encourage recognition of the group as a group. This, in turn, would encourage the macroscopic focus, which enables one to recognize the oppression and encourages the individual's identification and solidarity with other individuals of the group or category. But physical confinement and segregation of the group as a group is not common to all oppressive structures, and when an oppressed group is geographically and demographically dispersed, the perception of it as a group is inhibited. There may be little or nothing in the situation of the individuals encouraging the macroscopic focus which would reveal the unity of the structures bearing down on all the members of that group. <clears throat> A great many people, female and male of every race and class, simply do not believe that woman is a category of oppressed people, and I think that this is in part because they have been fooled by the dispersal and assimilation of women throughout and into the system of class and race without with which organize men. Our simply being dispersed makes it difficult for women to have knowledge of each other and hence difficult to recognize and shape our common cage. The dispersal and assimilation of women throughout the economic classes and races also divides us against each other practically and economically and thus attaches interest in the inability to see, for some jealousy of their benefits and for some resentment of others' advantages. To get past this, it helps to notice that in fact women of all races and classes are together in a ghetto of sorts. There is a woman's place, a sector, which is inhibited inhabited by women of all classes and races, and it is not defined by geographical boundaries, but by function. The function is the service of men and men's interests as men define them, which includes the bearing and rearing of children. The details of the service and the working conditions vary by race and class, for men of different races and classes have different interests, perceive their interests differently, and express their needs and demands in different rhetorics, dialects, and languages. But there is also some constants. Whether in lower, middle, or upper-class home or work situations, women's service work always includes the personal service, the work of maids, butlers, cooks, personal secretaries, sexual service, including provisions for his genital sexual needs and bearing his children, but also including, quote-unquote, being nice and, quote-unquote, being attractive for him, and ego service, encouragement, support, praise, and attention. Women's service work also is characterized everywhere by the fatal combination of responsibility and powerlessness. We are held responsible and we, are, we hold ourselves responsible for good outcomes for men and children in almost every respect, though we, though we have in almost no case power adequate to that project. The details of the subjective experience of the servitude are local. They vary with economic class and race and ethnic situations as well as the personalities of the men in question. So also are the details of the forces which coerce our tolerance of this servitude, particular to the work, to the different situations in which different women live and work. 
All this is not to say that women do not have, assert, or manage sometimes to satisfy our own interests, not to deny that in some cases, in some respects, women's in independent interests do overlap with men's. But in every race slash class level and even across race, race and class lines, men do not serve women as women serve men. Quote unquote, women's sphere may be understood as the quote unquote service sector, taking the latter expression much more widely and deeply than is usual in discussions of the economy. Three. <clears throat> It seems to be the human condition that one degree, in one degree or another, we all suffer frustration and limitation, all encounter unwelcome bar barriers, and are all damaged and hurt in various ways. Since we are a social species, almost all of our behavior and activities are structured by more than individual inclinations and the conditions of the planet and its atmosphere. No human is free of social structures, nor, perhaps, would happiness consist in such freedom. Structures consist of boundaries, limits, and barriers. In a structured whole, some motions and changes are possible and others are not. If one is looking for an excuse to dilute the word oppression, one can use the fact of social structure as an excuse and say that everyone is oppressed. But if one would rather get a clear about what oppression is and is not, one needs the sort of sorry, one needs to sort out the sufferings, harms, and limitations and figure out which are elements of oppression and which are not. <clears throat> From what I have already said here, it is clear that if one wants to determine whether a particular suffering, harm, or limitation is part of someone's being oppressed, one has to look at it in context in order to tell whether it is an element of an oppressive structure. One has to see if it is part of an enclosing structure of forces and barriers which tend which tends to the immobilization and reduction of a group or category of people. One has to look at how the barrier or force fits within others and to whose benefit or detriment it works. As soon as one looks for examples, it becomes obvious that not everything which frustrates or limits a person is oppressive and not every harm or damage is due to or contributes to oppression. If a rich right, white playboy who lives off income from his investments in South African diamond mines should break a leg in a skiing accident in the Aspen and wait in pain in the blizzard for hours before he is rescued, we may assume that in that period he suffers. But the suffering comes to an end. His leg is repaired by the best surgeons money can buy, and he is soon recuperating in a lavish suite, sipping Shiva Regal. Nothing in this picture suggests the structures or barriers suggests structures of barriers or forces. He is a member of several oppressed groups and does not suddenly become oppressed because, sorry, he is a member of several oppressor groups and does not suddenly become oppressed because he is injured or in pain. Even if the accident was caused by someone's malicious negligence, and hence someone can be blamed for it and morally faulted, that person still does not, still has not been an agent of oppression. Consider also the restriction of having to drive one's vehicle on a certain side of the road. road. There is no doubt that this restriction is almost unbearably frustrating at times when one's lane is not moving and the other lane is clear. There are surely times even when abiding by this regulation would have harmful consequences, but the restriction is obviously wholesome for, for most of us most of the time. The restraint is imposed for our benefit and does benefit, it, benefit us. Its operation tends to encourage our continued motion, not to immobilize us. The limit imposed by traffic regulations are limits most of us would cheerfully impose on ourselves given what we know others would follow them to. They are part of a structure which shapes our behavior, not um, our reduction or immobilization, but rather to the, op to the protection of our continued ability to move and act as we will. Another example, the boundaries of a racial ghetto in an American city serve to some extent to keep white people from going in as well as to keep ghetto dwellers from going out. A particular white citizen may be frustrated or feel deprived because she slash he cannot, con cannot stroll around there and enjoy the quote-unquote exotic aura of a quote-unquote foreign culture or shop for bargains in the ghetto swap shops. In fact, the existence of the ghetto of racial segregation does deprive the white person 
of knowledge and harm his slash her characteristic by nurturing unwarranted feelings of superiority. But this does not make the white person in that situation a member of an oppressed race or a person oppressed because of her slash his race. One must look at the barrier. It limits the activities and the access of those on both sides of it, though to different degrees. But it is a product of the intention, planning, and action of whites for the benefit of whites to secure and maintain privileges that are available to whites generally as members of the dominant and privileged groups. Though the existence of the barriers has some bad consequences for whites, the barrier does not exist in systemic relationship with other barriers and forces forming a structure oppressive to whites. The contrary. Quite the contrary. It is part of a structure which oppresses the ghetto dwellers and thereby and by white intention, protects the further in whites' interests as dominating white culture and understands them. This barrier is not oppressive to whites, even though it is a barrier to whites. Barriers have different meanings to those of opposite sides of them, even though they are barriers to both. The physical walls of a prison no more dissolve to let an outsider in than to let an outsider out, an insider out. But for the insider, they are confining and limiting, while to the outsider, they may be seen as protection from what she takes to be threats poised by insiders, freedom from harm or anxiety. A set of social and economic barriers and forces separating two groups may be felt even painfully by members of both groups and yet may be conf mean confinement to one and liberty and enlargement of opportunity to the other. The service sector of wives, mamas, assistants, girls is almost exclusively a women-only sector. Its boundaries not only enclose women, but to a very great extent, keep men out. <clears throat> Some men sometimes encounter this barrier and experience it as a restriction to their movement, their activities, and their control, or their choice of quote-unquote lifestyle. Thinking they might like the simple nurturement life, which they may imagine to be quite free of stress, alienating, alienation, and hard work, and feeling deprived since it seemed closed off to them, they thereupon announce that they dis the discovery that they are oppressed too by quote unquote sex roles. But that barrier is erected and maintained by men for the benefit of men. It consists of cultural and economic forces and pressures in a culture and economy controlled by men, in which at every economic level and in all racial and ethnic subcultures, economy, tradition, and even ideologies for liberation work to keep at least local culture and economy in male control. The boundary that sets apart women's sphere is maintained and promoted by men generally for the benefit of men generally. And men generally do benefit from its existence, even the men who bumps into it and complains of his inconvenience. That barrier is protecting his classification and status as a male, as superior, as having a right to sexual access to a female or females. It protects a kind of citizenship which is superior to that of females of his class and race, his access to a wider range of better paying and higher status work, and his right to prefer unemployment to the degradation of doing lower status or quote-unquote women's work. If a person's life or activity is affected by some force of barrier that person encounters, one may not conclude that the person is oppressed simply because the person encounters that barrier or force, nor simply because the encounter is unpleasant, frustrating, or painful to that person at that time, nor simply because the experience, the existence of the barrier or force, or the process which maintain or apply it, serve to deprive that person of something of value. One must look at the barrier or force and answer certain questions about it. Who constructed and maintains it? Whose interests are served by the by its existence? Is it part of a structure which tends to confine, reduce, and immobilize some group? Is the individual member of the conf is the individual a member of the confined group? Various forces, barriers, and limitations a person may encounter or live with may be part of an oppressive structure or not. And if they are, the person may be on either the oppressed or the oppressor side of it. One cannot tell which by how loudly or how little the person complains. Four. Many of the restrictions and limitations we live with 
are more or less internalized and self-monitored and are a part of our adaptations to the requirements and expectations imposed by the needs and tastes and tyrannies of others. I have in mind such things as women's cramped postures and attenuated strides and men's restraint of emotional self-expression, except for anger. Who gets what out of the practice of those disciplines and what imposes the penalties or sorry, and who imposes the penalties for improper relaxations of them? What are the rewards for this self-discipline? Can men cry? Yes, in the company of women. If a man cannot cry, it is the company of men, it is in the company of men that he cannot cry. It is men, not women, who require this restraint, and men not only require it, they reward it. The man who maintains a steely or rough or laid-back demeanor, all our forms which suggest invulnerability, marks him as a member of the male community and is esteemed by other men. Consequently, the maintenance of that demeanor contributes to the man's self-esteem. It is felt as good, and he can feel good about himself. The way this restriction fits into the structures of men's lives is as one of the socially required behaviors which, if carried off, contributes to their acceptance and respect by significant others and to their own self-esteem. It is to their benefit to practice this discipline. Consider by comparison the discipline of women's cramped physical posture and attenuated stride. This discipline can be related, or sorry, relaxed in the company of women. It generally is at its most strenuous in the company of men. Like men's emotional restraint, women's physical restraint is required by men. But unlike the case of men's emotional restraint, women's physical restraint is not rewarded. What do we get for it? Respect and esteem and, esteem and acceptance? No. They mock us and parody our mincing steps. We look silly and competent, weak, and generally contemptible. Our exercise of this discipline tends to low esteem and low self-esteem. It does not benefit us. It fits in a network of behavior through which we constantly announce to others our membership in a lower caste and our unwillingness slash in inability to defend our bodily or moral integrity. It is degrading and part of a pattern of degradation. Acceptable behavior for both groups, men and women, involves a required restraint that seems in itself silly and perhaps damaging, but the social effect is drastically different. The women's restraint is part of the structure oppressive to women. The men's restraint is part of the structure oppressive to women. Five. One is marked for application of oppressive pressures by one's membership in some group or category. Much of one's suffering and frustration befalls one partly or largely because one is a member of that category. In the case at hand, it is the category women, being a woman, is a major factor in my not having a better job than I do. Being a woman selects me as a likely victim of sexual assault or harassment. It is my being a woman that reduces the power of my anger to a proof to my, of my insanity. If a woman has little or no economic political power, or achieves little of what she wants to achieve, a major casual factor sorry, causal factor in this is that she is a woman. For any woman of any race or economic class, being a woman is significantly attached to whatever disadvantages and deprivations she suffers, be they great or small. None of this is the case with respect to a person's being a man. Simply being a man is not what stands between him and a better job. Whatever assaults or harassments he is subjected to, being a male is not what selects him for victimization. Being a male is not a factor which would make his anger impotent, quite the opposite. If a man has little or no material or political power, or achieves little of what he wants to achieve, his being a male is no part of that explanation. Being male is something he is going that he has going for him, even if race or class or age or disability is going against him. Women are oppressed as women. Members of certain racial and or economic groups and classes, both the males and the females, are oppressed as members of those races or classes. But men are not oppressed as men. And isn't it strange that any of us should have been confused and mystified about such a simple thing? Okay, I'm going to start another stream for like a discussion.
So go back to my page and you'll see it in a second.